Yep, John chapter 13. We're, we'll be reading verses 1 to 15, and you can find that on page 956. But as we start reading, please join with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Please help us to hear what you have to say to us today, and please give us the strength to imitate your Son. Amen. So John chapter 13. Before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who are in the world, he loved them to the end. Now when it was time for the supper, the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, Simon Iscariot's son, to betray him. Jesus knew that the Father had given everything into his hands, that he had come from God and that he was going back to God. So he got up from the supper, laid aside his outer clothing, took a towel, tied it around himself. Next, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet to dry them with the towel tied around him. He came to Simon Peter who asked him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you don't realise now, but afterwards you will understand. You will never wash my feet, Peter said. Jesus replied, If I don't wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. One who has bathed, Jesus told him, doesn't need to wash anything except his feet. He is completely clean. You are clean, but not all of you, for he knew who would betray him. This is why he said, not all of you are clean. When Jesus had washed their feet and put on his outer clothing, he reclined again and said to him, do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are speaking rightly, since that is what I am. So if I, your teacher and Lord, have washed your feet, so you ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should also do just as I have done for you. This is the word of the Lord. This is a passage that I'm sure many of you have heard a number of times before. It's our Sunday school favourite. But have you ever wondered why John bothered to write it down at all? In fact, why did Matthew, Mark, Luke and John go to all the trouble of writing down all the things that Jesus said and did? The church then copied and preserved those words throughout centuries of history. That's a lot of effort for a first century rabbi, was it really worth it? Why did they think it was so important to record the words of this one guy? There were plenty of rabbis throughout the first century and none of them get remembered. Why is Jesus so important? Well, here in John 13, John actually gives us two reasons why it is so important to remember what Jesus has done and why he has done it. And both these reasons stand to show us who we are before God and how he expects us to live. You see, John starts this part of his biography by telling us when this event happened in the life of Jesus. He said in verse 1 that it's just before the Passover. Oh, okay, okay. Sure, that's nice. Jesus celebrated dozens and dozens of Passover in his life. Just telling us it was the Passover doesn't help. That happens every year. Which Passover, John? Well, he goes on to say that Jesus knew that his hour had come. Throughout John's life story of Jesus, he uses this phrase, Jesus' hour, quite a lot. And every time it's in reference to what is going to happen at the cross. Because that is the hour that Jesus fulfills the reason why he came. And so when John says that Jesus know his hour is coming and that it's Passover, we know that this just isn't any Passover that Jesus is having with his disciples, 
but it's the Passover, the final Passover that Jesus is sharing with his disciples right before he gets arrested, taken to court, and killed on a Roman cross. And this fact is going to help us understand exactly what happens next because Jesus knows what's about to happen and he wants to show his disciples what it means, what is going to happen next and what it means. So imagine this, you're one of the disciples. You've been following around this great teacher for a few years now. You've sat down to another Passover meal with your teacher and your mates. As the supper gets started to serve, Jesus gets up, takes off his jacket, ties a towel around his waist, grabs a bowl of water, and starts washing feet. We don't understand it now, but this is absolutely scandalous. Teachers and lords don't wash feet. That's a job reserved for the lowest slave in the household. Husbands and wives didn't wash each other's feet in the first century. It's too menial a task. It doesn't happen. You get your Gentile slaves to wash your feet because it's too low a task for your Jewish slaves to do it. And yet here, Jesus, the Lord and Master, gets up and starts washing feet. Scandalous. Shouldn't happen. Imagine if you had Queen Elizabeth round for dinner one day and after the meal she started washing your dishes. The Queen doesn't do that. It's not right. You should be washing her dishes. Well, that's what's going on here. It shouldn't be happening. And so Peter, in his think first, think last, ask questions later, kind of attitude, jumps up. You're not going to wash my feet, are you, Jesus? You shouldn't be doing this. And so Jesus replies somewhat harshly to our ears. If I don't wash you, you have no part with me. Well, that's a bit harsh, isn't it? Jesus is doing something that he really shouldn't be doing. And Jesus says that, If Peter doesn't get his feet washed, he has no part with Jesus. Are Peter's feet just so gross that Jesus needs to make an ultimatum? If I don't wash your feet, you're going to have to leave. It stinks. Well, that's not what's going on. Because if we we have a look at verse 10, we see what Jesus is getting at. One who is bathed, Jesus told him, doesn't need to wash anything except his feet. He is completely clean. You see, knowing that this is happening just before his death, knowing that Jesus expects his disciples to be washed, shows us that Jesus doesn't care about Peter's feet. He cares about his soul because something is missing. The disciples have believed God's word They're following God's chosen king. They're living as part of God's kingdom. For the most part, they're clean. But something is missing. Their rebellion against God and the punishment that that deserves still hangs over their head. They are still cursed by God because of their rejection of him in their lives. But what's coming up? Jesus' death is the missing piece. It's the death of Jesus that cleans the disciples of their rebellion, of their sin, so that they can become full members of God's kingdom again. This is why Jesus said, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. He's not talking about the feet. He's talking about his death and what is coming. Because if we don't accept Jesus' death for us, if we don't let him take the punishment that our sins deserve, then we have no part with him. Our rebellion against God demands punishment. The death of Jesus takes the punishment that we deserved so that we no longer have to face it. 
It is the event that washes us clean and allows us to come before God's throne and call him Father. And so the question this forces us to ask is, have you let Jesus wash you? Or are you still trying to earn your way to God on your own? The standard that God sets is perfection. If we continue to strive after it on our own, we'll never make it. We cannot earn our place in God's kingdom. We cannot deserve it. We cannot buy it. It is only achieved by what Jesus has done for us. And so we need to trust him. Let him be the one who cleans us. Stop trying to do it on our own. Stop trying to earn it by our own good works and merit and let him do it for us. This is the first reason why the disciples and the early church went to so much trouble to record what happened in Jesus' life, to preserve it, to copy it, to make sure that we could have it sitting in our pews in front of us. Because this is the event that makes us right with God. It is Jesus' death and nothing else that enables us to become part of God's kingdom. I mean, plenty of clubs and societies have membership requirements. Some of them want you to work in particular industries. Some of them expect you to be related to the right people. Even the gym expects an annual membership fee. The only membership requirement for God's kingdom is trusting in the death of Jesus, trusting that it has paid the penalty that we deserved so that we could come back and have our relationship with our creator fixed. The second reason that the disciples went to so much trouble recording Jesus' story is that it serves as an example for us of how to live in this kingdom that he has brought us into. Did you see that in verse 14? So, if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, so you ought to wash one another's feet. Well, what does Jesus mean? I mean, we can't copy his death, which the feet washing is pointing to, and the invention of modern shoes means that Washing people's feet at dinner doesn't really mean anything anymore. So what's he going on about? He wants us to copy his attitude. Did you notice the reason why Jesus does this in verse 3? Jesus knew that the Father had given everything into his hands, that he had come from God and that he was going back to God. So he got up from the supper. Jesus is king. Everything has been given into his hands. He has come from God. If he wanted to, he had every right to bust out of that room, call down an army of angels, depose Pilate and the emperor, take up his throne and demand everybody worship him. He had the power to do that. But that's not what he does with his power. When he sees all the power that he has, he gets down and serves. And that's the attitude that he's calling us to emulate. An attitude that says, I will use my power for the good of others, even if it means looking meek and lowly. This is what Jesus wants us to copy. Back in around 2010, a new craze swept the internet. It was called power posing. This was a great craze. It said that if you adopted certain bodily positions, you would feel filled with power and confidence and you'd be able to ace whatever it is came next. The internet loved it. There were heaps of stories of people doing these power poses before interviews, speeches, auditions, dance recitals, and how they aced it. 
the science is keeps going back and forth. They can't decide whether it works or if it's just a placebo, but the internet loved it. And as you can imagine, all these power poses are full of power and strength. It's V for victory, I win. It's the superhero, hands on hips, staring off into the distance. I should be in a movie kind of pose. Jesus had a power pose too. And as we've just seen, it's not filled with strength and victory, but it's a towel around the waist, bowl of water in one hand, on his knees. And then, a week later, its arms stretched out and nailed to a cross. What's your power pose look like? Is your power pose all about you and strength and victory and achievement? Or is it about humility and service? Washing of people's feet was reserved for the lowest of low slaves. Jesus doesn't wash people's feet. He doesn't die for them because he has no power, because he is weak, but precisely the opposite. He serves because he has all power and challenges us. How will you use your power? Where do you have power in your life? Do you have power over your colleagues at work? Do you have influence in your family or amongst your friends? Are you using that power to serve? Are you trying to keep your colleagues down so that you can climb higher on the corporate ladder, no matter what the cost? Or are you building them up, helping them to do their jobs better? Do you work with your family to help them to be who they need to be, to help them to achieve what they need to achieve? Are you working for their good or are you constantly belittling them, tearing them down, hampering their progress? Friends, this is why no form of abuse can ever be justified by the Bible. Anyone who uses the Bible to justify the use of power that belittles, destroys, or abuses anyone is clearly against what Jesus wants us to do with our power. He says, no, that's not good enough. If you have power, your job is to use it to serve, no matter what it makes you look like. Jesus washed feet. Jesus died the most shameful and humiliating death that humanity has ever come up with. Not because he was weak, but because he was powerful and wanted to cleanse a people from himself to live with God so that we could join him forever in the new creation. We started this sermon asking the question, Why did Matthew, Mark, Luke and John go to so much trouble to write down what Jesus did for us? Why did the church spend so much time, money and effort copying it, making sure that we could read it? Because this is the event. The life, death and resurrection of Jesus is the one thing that makes us right with our creator God. It is the event in history that fixes the punishment that we so rightly deserve for our rebellion and allows us to call God Father. And then it serves as an example for us to show us how we are to use the power that God has given us in whatever area of life we happen to have it and says, don't use your power for yourself Don't use your power to gain more power or influence or money. Use your power to serve. Follow the example of the one who had ultimate power and still used it not to glorify himself but to save us. 
Have you let Jesus wash you? If we do not accept his death for us, we have no part with him. What are you doing with your power? And will you use it to serve others? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the life of your Son. We thank you that in his death our punishment has been taken away. And now we ask that you will enable us to use the power that you have given us for the good of others so that we might follow in his footsteps. Amen.